Hey everybody, and welcome back to our channel. Today I'm going to cover for you how Starlink worked as Jen and I traveled down to the south of Ontario on the north shore of Lake Erie into Michigan and up through the Upper Peninsula back into Canada and across Ontario's little north. If you're new to the channel, this is our channel where we cover all kinds of cool stuff from birding to hiking, outdoor adventures, air streaming, wellness, basically everything that we're interested in that isn't tea. We have a whole other channel dedicated to awesome tea. You can check that out in the links down below if you're into tea. So subscribe if this interests you and be sure to click that notify bell so you'll know whenever we post a new video. So I put up a Starlink unboxing video and ran a quick speed test, um, but I didn't have a chance to use it extensively. And this video is to address that. So in this video, I'll get into how well does Starlink actually work out in the wild, in the field where we're working with it, using it on a daily basis, and whatnot. During this trip, Jen and I both worked remotely, and both of our works require an internet connection. Uh, Jen uh, obviously uploads and takes care of the YouTube videos, so there's a fairly large upload there, and I do a large amount of teleconferencing, um, logging into remote systems, uh, using VPN, all kinds of my whole job is connected. So I would say we are at least moderate, if not moderate to heavy internet users, just to give you a gauge of how much uh, sort of juice we needed from Starlink to keep our internet existence going. I also wanted to cover in this video how Starlink worked in various geographic locations. So that's Southwestern Ontario, uh, Michigan and the Upper Peninsula and Lower Peninsula and Ontario is a little north. This trip consisted of a series of boondockers welcome locations, uh, a casino campground and some crown land or BLM, it's, which is BLM land for those of you in the US but up in Canada we call it crown land. So we got a quite a bit of uh, diversity of styles of campsites and of course where possible we used Wi-Fi and LTE but once we were into the United States, uh, we had no LTE coverage because we didn't extend the coverage of our phones to include that, and we were entirely dependent on uh, Starlink for our internet connectivity. Yep. <laughs> no, no, seriously, seriously. All right. So I had a pretty good day uh, working today on uh, a combination of LTE and Starlink. In fact, uh, we're in a fairly, uh, it's not really rural, it's a small town and the LTE seemed to be fine. Uh, well, in fact, we started on Wi-Fi and uh, went to LTE. Then my LTE conked out during the Zoom meeting. I couldn't um, share my screen. So I switched to Starlink and it worked great. Um, had several Zoom calls. Um, it, it wasn't perfect, like every now and then the connection would get a little faulty, but it would come back and I was able to share my screen where I wasn't able to do that on LTE. And um, yeah, I have to say overall quite well, quite good. Um, Jen uploaded a YouTube video, so uh, be sure to check for that on the uh, Gen T YouTube channel. Overall, we deployed Starlink in six locations and by and large, it worked pretty great. In a few of the locations, however, I had to adjust the antenna position to improve the connection. And we're gonna get into all the details about where, when, and how I did that uh, as we continue through this video, so stay tuned. So just like in the unboxing video, the setup and takedown of Starlink is so incredibly easy, it's almost not worth discussing. But I will cover a couple key aspects that kind of came into play once I was out on campgrounds, at boondockers welcomes, in various locations that, that I felt feel are practical. First is modem location. Initially, I was keeping the modem tucked in the wheel well of Garfield, our Airstream, so outdoors. Um, so it was very easy to run the antenna, the cable to the antenna. The router was tucked under the wheel well. Um, this gave it shelter from the elements. Uh, it does have weatherproofing on the connections and the Wi-Fi was coming in through the walls of the Airstream to us inside the Airstream. All right, so I just uh, set up Starlink and had a quick look around here. And despite this big bank of trees behind me, the rest of this area is really open sky. So I think this will work out. Um, the cable, when you get it open at home, feels super long. It's not that long. It barely reaches to the front of the rig here. My electricity is there in the middle of the Airstream. You can see the uh, tester still plugged in in orange. 
I've got Starlink tucked, maybe unwisely, but tucked in between the wheels under the wheel well, the Starlink router. And then I've put the antenna on a mat. I put a little mat down so the metal feet wouldn't scratch the roof. And the generator's kind of powering the whole thing. And there it goes. You can see it's now gonna look for a satellite. So it can spin 360. As you can see, it's now doing that. And it's just searching for satellites. So I'm hoping the satellites it needs are not hiding behind those trees. Uh, we did a setup in Aylmer, Ontario that was quite covered as well and it worked pretty good. Despite that, it was able to contact enough satellites to give me a reasonable connection. I have to admit though, um, I wasn't overly comfortable with that. Uh, I, this is how Starlink was introduced to me. I met some RVers who had it. They kind of raved about how great it was for, um, you know, having internet any, just about anywhere. You know, we're often off grid when we're in an RV. That's the whole point is to get to these beautiful locations, but sometimes we need to be connected. So they had tucked theirs in the wheel well and it was working for them. And so that's kind of how I defaulted. Um, I, and, and I wasn't overly comfortable with it. So eventually what I did was I ran that network cable through the front trunk of Garfield, our Airstream, and I had the router inside the Airstream. And uh, in the end, this is how I will probably continue to set this up for the foreseeable future. All right, so um, the Starlink on the car roof has worked out fine. It was able to pick up satellites. It's starting to drizzle now, so we'll get to test its weatherproofness. And there's been some pretty good gusts of wind that haven't um, even moved the dish uh, at all, so that's good. Now I'm still running Starlink, um, but unlike before where I had it plugged into the side of the trailer here and the router was tucked down between the wheels, you can see it's gone. It didn't get stolen. Everything's fine. And now I have it right here. I've got the router in the trailer and plugged into an inverter circuit so I can run it on battery uh, without the generator running. Okay, the generator, you might have noticed it uh, behind me and you certainly can't hear it. It's still sitting there, but it's off. So the battery was fully charged and there's no need to run the generator and make noise and waste gas anymore. But we need internet to do a little video work and uh, uploading and stuff. So I, I sparked this back up in this configuration and it also works fine. This will also probably get us a better signal in the trailer. So um, yeah, this is the other setup I'm exploring. Of course, the cable is slightly pinched here. This is a sealed, this is a sealed um, um, case and I'm hope, hopefully I don't wreck the seal or uh, cause any other kind of issues there. We'll see. I have heard of and seen uh, people build, uh, you know, build or modify their, maybe their cable TV input to their RV or whatever for a Starlink connector. And I am interested in that. I'm probably not gonna pull the trigger on it anytime soon because I've got a kind of a viable workaround. But if you have experience with that or if that has worked for you, uh, let me know in the comments down below. Or if you're doing something more similar to myself and that's working for you, let me know. The next consideration and setup, once you're in the wild, uh, is antenna location. Where are you going to put that satellite receiver, that satellite dish? In many ways, this is a much bigger deal than the modem location because this is what affects the quality of your service. So, at our first, so I'm going to get into a bunch of details about this because this gets into sort of the, the brass tacks of getting decent Starlink uh, reception. But uh, overall, for antenna location, I want to say that the very first time I set it up, I did use the app to kind of survey the sky and get a f and figure out uh, how good my location was going to be and if it would work. And once I did that once, uh, I never did it again. So out of all six of our locations, I only used the app to figure out the location of the antenna once because it, it's pretty simple to kind of eyeball it. You just look up and look around and see what the obstructions are with your own eyes and you can kind of put the antenna down and go, okay, let's try it out. We'll get into that. But there's another aspect of outdoor setup that's practical that also wasn't covered in the unboxing. And that is, uh, you know, your antenna goes outside. Uh, so it's going to get dirty. It's going to get bugs on it. It's going to get stuff on it. So this is another aspect that actually I didn't even think of until I first until if the, one of our uh, early, de early deployments of Starlink, we, 
I was going to bring the antenna base and the antenna back into the RV and I'm really glad I had a look under that antenna. It was full of little bugs, little creepy crawlers covered all over it. It was actually super gross. Yeah, so I'm just bringing this in after we used it today and there's a little no seams, little bugs have crawled up into the frame. I was about to go inside with it and luckily there were some on the white and I noticed them and then I noticed a bunch crawling on the frame. So we're just gonna give it a little spray with some rubbing alcohol or, or somehow get these guys out of here. I mean, ideally if you could store this outdoors, probably you wouldn't even bring this in again. This is pretty easy to give a wipe, but yeah. Anyway. So, um, yeah, so just keep that in mind that when you bring it in for the night or whatever, or when you're getting ready to move again, before you throw it into a, a living space where you don't want bugs or mud or other kinds of dirt, have a look underneath that, uh, underneath that antenna to make sure there's no creepy crawlers. So this time we put the Starlink in a quite, uh, in the middle of the lawn kind of thing, very open. Uh, we try to put that close to the car, but uh, just even a little bit of the tree seems to give it a trouble. It drops quite a lot. So we moved it. Obstructions. In three out of our six locations, I had to actually, you know, we used, I just set up Starlink. We used it a bit and I went out and moved the antenna to kind of improve the experience. This is super easy. You just walk outside grab the antenna and move it to a new location and if you really want you can kind of reboot Starlink to kind of re-track the antennas but generally you don't need to do this even do this so I may have been able to avoid this by using the app all the time to uh, survey the sky but my honest opinion is it's no it's it's not much time saving so you use you spend the time up front to find it or you take a guess throw it down try it out um, and then you go out and move it and go back in. I think it might actually be faster than doing the whole sky scan with the app and and then if you're wrong you've got to do the sky scan again with the app and move it anyway. I just look up, have a look around, put the antenna down, go inside, maybe do a speed test, maybe just do some work. Um, you have to let Starlink soak in a little bit and it'll start to predict how, uh, if it's going to have outages uh, and how f it'll even tell you how frequently it thinks it's gonna have them and then you can wait and see if it's true and if it's overly frequent, move the antenna. And if it's not overly frequent and you can live with it, then just live with it. On that note, um, I did have situations where the best I could get was maybe a brief 10 second outage once every 15, 20, 30 minutes. I just couldn't get the antenna in a better location based on the amount of cable I had and my, my, the details of my location. And honestly, it wasn't a big deal. Even on teleconference calls or Zoom calls, whatever I was doing with people, I just, uh, the app tells you clearly what the situation is and then you get a feel for whether or not it's true. And I just told people, I said, hey, I'm working remotely. I've got a bit of a connection issue. I'm going to blink out every now and then. Just hold tight. I'll be back. And uh, my calls didn't even drop. It, I, just, I just went. People just couldn't hear me for 10 seconds. Then they could hear me and see me again. So it was that simple to manage this sort of certainly sub-ideal conditions. But they worked for me. Um, I was able to just tell folks, hey, that's going to happen, brace for it, and they braced for it, and I always came back and we continued our conversation. I don't remember any cases where the connection was so bad I couldn't maintain. Um, actually, yes, I do. The very first location, we, were, we had quite a amount of obstruction, and I actually stopped using video. So I had to just go down to just audio in that location. We had quite a high tree circle around us that we just couldn't get quite the signal. Ironically, this was in southwestern Ontario where I also had LTE and uh, host Wi-Fi. And none of those options worked very well either. So I ended up using Starlink, even in the presence of LTE and Wi-Fi, because it was the least worst. And it wasn't perfect, but it was good enough. In another situation, up in Blind River, Ontario, again, we were quite treed in. 
Um, I took a guess at the location. It was pretty mediocre, pretty bad experience. And when I moved the antenna around to various ground locations, I'm, I've been just putting it on the ground or a picnic table so far, I couldn't improve it much. So at, in that location, I ended up actually putting the antenna on top of Garfield, our airstream. And I did that without the assistance of a ladder. So that was tricky. But I can assure you that neither myself, Garfield the antenna, or my car was harmed getting the antenna up there. But uh, I wasn't overly comfortable with that. So I'm thinking about a way, uh, bringing a ladder basically, so I can get that up on top of the Airstream if necessary. Okay, RV realities with Starlink. Let's talk a little bit about battery usage. I didn't go uh, super technical with battery usage. The most I did was at one point when nothing else was turned on in the RV and we were on battery, on inverter, uh, off the battery. I, uh, I, we had all our laptops running and Starlink and I had a quick look at the power draw off on the inverter and it was running somewhere just under 100 watts. So not very scientific, but it gave me an idea of what is the sort of consumption of uh, Starlink and the laptops when we're boondocking and we're on battery. Uh, we don't have a solar setup, so we're just going on the battery and when that gets low, we fire up the generator. Um, from a practical perspective, uh, during the day, if we did a whole work day, we would fire up the generator uh, a few times to top up the battery. Run it for a bit, top up the battery, and then go without the generator for a while until it, the battery got low. I think it was about twice a day we had to spark the generator during a regular working day, pretty much full-time laptops, full-time um, Starlink, and of course the fridge is going off and on as it needs to, hopefully. All right, just a little uh, Starlink update. We're on Crown Land with very poor LTE and even cell reception. So I was on a voice call and uh, I couldn't be understood well. Whoops, my finger got in there. Couldn't be understood well. Uh, so I switched to just voice over data via Starlink and it worked great. Um, fully boondocking here, no service whatsoever. Uh, what I mean is no water, no electric. Uh, we're running off of generator. Uh, the Starlink does use battery fairly, uh, you know, fairly promptly. So we'll need to have the generator running. But it works great. And we did not leave Starlink running overnight. Why would we? There is no one there to use it. And if you saw our first video, that brings me to my next topic, security. Um, if you, if you saw that first video, you know we had an unfortunate incident with campsite theft. So we just lock up everything now when we go to sleep that's outside of the trailer, um, including Starlink, the Starlink satellite dish, which is the only piece left outside. Um, so yeah, so we just I just wrap it up. I throw it in Odie, the minivan, and uh, pull it out the next night, put it in roughly the same location, pointing in roughly the same direction, and that's been flawless. I haven't had to kind of rejig or anything, or it seems to just take care of itself. So as you can imagine, um, I'm super excited to get back out there, get back on the road, get using Starlink again, but I do have some concerns. Um, my main concern is getting treed in. We love to get ourselves into remote locations, uh, you know, and boondocking on, Crown land, BLM land, uh, it, just in a variety of fun and exciting, unique locations. And from what I've seen so far, uh, a, a dense tree, dense. If we're tree, if there's trees all around us, we're going to have some serious problems getting that satellite dish up high enough to have a good view of the sky. Um, so I'm. So I mentioned that I put it on the satellite dish on top of Garfield, the Airstream, that's helpful. I'm not sure it'll be enough in a, if we are in a real narrow um, site, uh, like a site where the trees come right in on us. Um, so I'm thinking about maybe some kind of a pole, either DIYing a pole or finding something sort of telescopic online. If you have solved this problem, please leave us a comment uh, down below and let us know how you solved it. But uh, the solution is obviously to just get that dish up near or above the tree line and you'll be gold. Uh, but sometimes the tree line's pretty tall, uh, sort of in the 
25 to 30 meter zone quite easily here in Canada. Let me translate. That's just under 100 feet, you know, sort of 75 to 100 feet, I think. I'm in the zone there, 60, 60 to 90 feet, that kind of zone. So pretty high. Uh, I can't imagine a pole that could reach that high, but maybe we don't need to get that high. Let me know if you have any experience with this. So again, that that about wraps it up for this trip. We we went to six locations. I do want to let you know where they were. Starling worked well in all of them. That's Aylmer, Ontario, Jeddo, Michigan, Mackinac Straits, Michigan, Blind River, Ontario, Owl Lake, Ontario, and the West Gate of Algonquin Park. So those are the six locations we tried it out. It worked great in all of those locations, again, with all the sort of jiggling around of the antenna, which I mentioned here, three of the six, um, worked great. In future videos, I do want to apply a little bit more methodology, give you a little bit more, maybe show you the live, what I'm dealing with live, like live. I'll get out my camera and kind of share with you what this situation looks like and show you where I decided to put the dish, let you know if I had to move it, maybe show you some on-screen speed tests or coverage of Starlink a little bit more for each place. Uh, if you think that would add to the quality of these videos, let me know. Um, and if there's other things that you'd like to see in these Starlink updates, let me know down below. Uh, I'm going to post more of them, so the more you let me know what you want to see, the more likely you are to see it. All right, folks, thanks for tuning in. That was Starlink update number one. Um, I'm looking forward to many more to come. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you like this kind of content and hit the notify bell so you'll know whenever we upload a new video. Until next time, keep the shiny side up. Starlink um, speed test on speedtest.net here in um, Michigan, pretty close to Port Huron. I will update the exact location because I don't know the name of where I am precisely. We're close to Jetto. Yes, we're close to Jetto, Michigan. Oh, wow, we can see that the Starlink's pretty terrible. Oh, I might have to redo because I'm downloading. <laughs> I'm downloading a bunch of Prime episodes, so that's pretty good. Uh, but actually, no, it's pretty, pretty bad. All right, and this is the speed test with my Prime download paused so it should be more representative mm -hmm. a little better still pretty slow here and I did notice when I was working with Google Maps it was chunky to download satellite images and whatnot so hmm, I guess it is what it is it worked I mean I was able to function I have internet where otherwise I wouldn't I don't know if there's good LTE here for people who have American LTE coverage. I do not, so it's absolutely not an option to use LTE on my phone here. So other than Starlink, I'm completely without data. So for me, this is fantastic, and you will have to figure out if this is going to work for you. Jenna's outside, and uh, we've got the dish set up. She's shown you where it is, and I'm just about to plug in the uh, modem here. So I'm reaching under the bed to grab the cable. I had to jiggle it a bit to get enough space. And I'm just plugging it into the butt of the modem here. And it's plugged in. And I'm going to tuck the modem back where it goes. And I have a little cubby hole for it, which I showed you in a previous video. And I will not close the bed with one arm this time. Jammed my finger last time, so. Since Starlink unplugged or rebooting. Which makes sense, I literally just plugged it in. And we'll see how to, what happens here. Doesn't take long, usually, before it starts to seek. I'll go check the connection. Oh, booting. Starlink is powering on. Searching for satellites. Hasn't moved yet. So, entering Starlink network. Wow, it didn't even move. Establishing a sure, secure connection. Now it's moving.
looking around. You know, it's not seconds, it's minutes, but it's not, you know, it's great when you're connected. So this was with the modem booted and Starlink disconnected and I disconnected the uh, Starlink dish and until it's will eventually finally be connected. It'll turn green here in a moment. Optimizing, getting online. Here we go. And the dish hasn't moved anymore since it did its initial little dance. And I'll finish off with a Starlink speed test. Eh, no, I'm going to... Uh... Oh, now it's talking. Jen has stopped videoing and is coming in. Hello. Hi. I'm doing a little screen recording up to just to get the whole length of how long it takes. It's pretty long. Still taking? Oh, it's still yeah. determining alignment, but I have a feeling it's going to pop online in a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if I did a speed test, I have a feeling we're already online. Mm -hmm. Not sure. No. Let's do that now. So that's Jen's little da 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 you heard there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do speedtest.net now and we'll see how the. Wow, uh, I cannot is. get your text message, huh? I didn't get your okay. message. Connecting? I'm talking to the video right now. Oh, wow, super fast here. Way faster than uh, at the farm where we were 1020. We're 160 down. Wow, that would be really uh, easy working. And 10. 10, 12 up. Okay. Latency. I'm just looking for the latency. The ping looks like it's 111. That's pretty bad. Latency. All right. Well, I'm happy with this. This seems to be a better connection than previously. And let's go back to the app. It's still determining alignment. So I'm going to let it do that and call that uh, good enough. It might move the dish again. Maybe get some even better connection. Who knows? But we're ready to get to work. Oh, it just finished. Connected. And there we have it. So basically less than five minutes, four and a half minutes. That's pretty great. Just here in Katrine, Ontario, um, Starling set up again. It's not in a great spot, but it's been up for many hours. We've been leaving it up. We've got electric here, so it's been up for well over 12 hours. And it's it's actually made a good map of the sky as Starlink sees it. And you can see that we're partially obstructed. Um, I'll show you where that's at later. But I just wanted to show you the, you know, give you some feedback on the results about this obstruction. So you can see my outages are minimal here. Um, you would see some, some dropouts here if there was outages. And you can get a list of them too. So you can see the last one was actually not that long ago, a couple hours ago. Um, and it was for nine seconds. Um, I'm working on, I just wanted to share this because I'm working on this connection and it's perfectly fine. Uh, I haven't had v many problems. I am, rather than doing voice and video on my laptop, I'm doing video only with voice on my phone because I do have coverage here. Ostensibly, I could be using LTE, but I prefer to just try out Starlink. Um, the video is not dropping out very frequently at all. Every now and then it, it seizes up and then it it carries on and the VPN connection I'm using to work over has not so much as dropped. So the, the outages are short enough that it's not meaningful. And then I just like to run a little uh, speed test to show you what kind of performance we're getting here. And you can see that it's relatively mediocre, uh, but again, good enough for me. Um, so just wanted to share that situation as I gain more experience with this freaking awesome tool, frankly. Uh, really happy with it.